other great multicultural poets. And um, so the goal is to get your students to a speaking. So it isn't just you memorize it, but they all have to practice the oral delivery that's been lost from poetry and so many arts. And there was this one student, this teacher had, and oh, she described him that, um, you know, hunched over the desk with the hoodie and I'm not going to look at you or talk to you. And then she came and leaned over the other side of the desk and kind of leaned down and wanted to say something to Johnny or whoever. And then he looked up and was like, I'm going to kill you if you don't get back off. And she did. She backed off. But they found this poem, and I'm failing to hear because I'm also not going to remember the poet's name, but this was a poem about the um, <coughs> Birmingham church bombing. And the uh, kid, oh, God, so sorry, I can't remember any of these things. I'll go Google it and tell you at the next session. But um, the kid read this poem, and it's about the little girls who want to go down um, downtown, and the mom says, no, you can't go. And they go anyhow, and they're in the church, and they die. And so the mom has written the poem. She goes down, or it's written in the mom's voice, that she finds one shoe from her daughter and went left in a little red shoe or something. So this boy found this poem in the catalog that they had to choose from, and it hit him. And he had a family member he remembered talking about Birmingham when he was a small child. And now he's like 16, 17, angry young man, right? And uh, she then, and they made a video of this process of watching this young man's transformation as he started to practice first only a couple lines, and then he got to go home and he, you know, and come back with five lines. And by the time he finished, and they recorded his presentation of the whole it's like four stanzas, and the class voted him the the best presenter, and he did go on in the competition in Washington. I don't know if he made it national. But to see that progression in her student and to see the students, and that's something I was going to suggest too, was have the students assess each other. You know, how is Gracie doing? Well, she used to be really scared. And now Gracie's not afraid to tell me what she thinks. And just through using the poetic arts or drama or any of these artistic forms, I think that when the kids connect, we're going to see their progress. And to me, that's a measurement. You know? So I'll try to look up that uh, that little video about, I think it is Poetry Out Loud. Thank you. Are there questions or comments? Um, I, I, think, um, I think that using the arts and performance in that way um, is really um, underutilized in schools and really underutilized as evidence of what children, of how they have grown. Um, in, across all disciplines. And uh, one of my personal favorites is Maxine Green, who speaks to that a great deal. But um, I think that we think assessing art or the arts or performance is a very complicated task. I'm assuming in Canada it's not quite that way because you're more artistic than we are. That's true. But, I, would, I would say one thing about the kind of larger context of uh, engagement or something like this. And it might seem, I, I think from an American point of view, maybe incredibly futile, but one of the big advantages uh, that we have in Canada is that we don't have the kind of federal intrusion on uh, public education that's, that is in every other country in the world. Uh, we don't have a, a ministry of education at the federal level. So when we start to talk about ways in which we can uh, transform the discourse around accountability, which is what this project is about, and, and implement it, it is certainly, I think, something that is on a scale that's achievable, that it's doable here. And we're talking about you know, working in, in British Columbia, um, not having to you know, it's a pretty defined context. And um, I think it, it, this kind of project is going to offer a very interesting kind of opportunity for a, a laboratory on how we, can, uh, how we can start to shift the discourse around accountability in ways that not only address the what, but also the how, and, and, the, and the base, the why, we, why, we want, why public education is important. So I think this is like a, a project that's really focused on uh, the most, one of the most important questions that is shaping what uh, uh, 
what public education is about. And I, I think we have a real opportunity here to, to, to make some impact. Um, I wanted to make two or three points, partly in response to some things that people said and partly in addition. First of all, the one, there was, there was a discussion in your last session about context, and, and Wayne makes the point. The context here is, is um, unlike uh, what it is in, in the States and in, in lots of the other places that people were talking about. We have a situation in BC where even the last two ministers of education in a very <coughs> reactionary government can't quite endorse the standardized testing 100%. They're there, they waffle around. You know, it's a, it's a snapshot, blah, 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 blah. Then they do it, and they have a huge bureaucracy around it, and they allow for it to be used in a way that, that, um, that is very dangerous. But even, even, uh, you know, Shirley Bond, some of you will know Shirley Bond, even Shirley Bond can't say, can't give a ringing endorsement to standardized testing. So, so that the, um, the context is, as Wayne says, a little bit different. The other thing is, we're going to almost certainly have a new government next year. And a government which has, which, let me tell you, let me tell you, I know better than most some of the limitations that that government will have. But it's much, it's infinitely more progressive, it will be infinitely more progressive than what we have. And they're interested in, ref in education reform, progressive <laughs> education reform, because you've got to say something. For, it's just, you know, sort of the marketplace of political ideas. They're going to run for election. They're going to get elected. <coughs> you got to say something about education. And they run up to the election, and they're interested in this stuff. Yep. Um, and to be fair, many of them are committed <coughs> to uh, a more progressive view of, uh, of how things work. Second point I wanted to make is on the how. You make, a, 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 first of all, on the metaphor, good point. We just take it, good point. Um, on the how, we actually have thought a little bit more about the how than I expressed here. There's only enough time. Sure. Uh, there's lots of how that we haven't figured out, but we've thought a little bit more about it than I was able to talk about here. The final point I wanted to make is that um, we said from the time we started meeting together, this is going to be a political struggle. This is about putting another agenda on the table, putting another narrative out there so that there can actually be a debate. Because as I said in my presentation, Every time we debate about uh, standardized testing, we're debating on their terms. We're debating on their narrative. We're, in some way, we're re presenting a critique, but in some way, we're reinforcing what they have to say. We think it's incredibly important that another point of view get laid on the table so that the debate shifts, so that the narrative shifts, so that we have a chance in, the, in that debate. I want to thank you, David, for coming and sharing with us. Right into the into the next session, and uh, Sandra Matheson is going to be moderating. Um, How about a quick washroom break?